Um, <clears throat> and I'm, since it's impossible for me to describe a whole language in just 40 minutes, I'm just going to divide it in four parts and go a bit fast. <laughs> but I'm just going to uh, put some links so you can read some more thorough thoughts on the programming language. And basically, I'm going to start a little bit on the background of the programming language, then an introduction to the language itself, uh, things like loops, how do you do loops, and basic statements, and so on. Uh, after that, I'm going to keep the big elephant in the room, which is concurrency. And finally, object-oriented Go. People say it's not object-oriented. Well, we can discuss that. And of course, you can interrupt me when you want. It's more interesting to you interrupt me rather than just do questions in the end. Anyways, uh, why a new language? Uh, well, Go was started by uh, some engineers at Google, and they have some um, requirements like languages have to be efficient, safe, concurrent, scalable, and what with the emphasis is that it has to have a fast development scale uh, cycle. Uh, uh, people at Google often talk about the C++, their C++ code bases that they just don't want to compile. I think that people here that have compiled Q can, can feel the pain too. Uh, so it had to be fast in the development cycle, but it also had to be scalable, safe, efficient, and, and also concurrent. So they geared towards a design that is lightweight, uh, concurrent, of course, object-oriented, but not in the usual way. We'll see about that later on. And it has to be pragmatic asset. Maybe it's a tough word, but I think it's... It's true. Well, what does lightweight mean as a language? <laughs> does it mean a small syntax or the, the runtime environment is? Uh, small, uh, the syntax is quite simple. Mm -hmm. if, the, if you look at the reference as in this link, a, the language is not too big <coughs> and the runtime itself is not too big either. So it has to be lightweight in a way that it's like the, exec the end executable file is light and the language itself, the syntax blocks, and everything is minimalistic, let's say, to put it in some words. And, but in March 2012, Go really, uh, the Go released the 1.0 release, which was important because they released the specification of the language, that you can look it up here. And they put the warranty that uh, code written in Go 1.0 will build and run in any version of the 1.x branch. An important quality. And since this is the free software group, uh, I, I think it's worth noting that Go is an open source project. It's, even though it started at Google, it, it's not a Google product. It's open source. I've contributed to it. So I guess people not related to Google can contribute to it. Uh, the first link is the code of Go, and then you have this page of the project itself. So the language is nice keywords. It's compiled, garbage collected, so it has a runtime, aesthetically typed, concurrent, and it's simple again. <laughs> it's <laughs> an objective class. Lightweight. And the mandatory Hello World application looks like this. So you here's write the package clause, then you can import things, and the main function looks like this, and print that hello world. We'll, we'll take a look at this later on. Wait, there's no semicolon there. Yeah. <laughs> no semicolon. Is it like JavaScript where it just tries to insert the semicolon? No, no, no. Or, <laughs> no it's not like that. It's not. Okay. End of line mark. The end of statement. So first of all, uh, Go program consists of packages. It's a set of packages, and a package consists of multiple source files, <coughs> .go files. Uh, in every source file, it starts with a package clause, as we've seen previously with package main, because it's, it contains the main function, so it has to be the main. And as some notes, the, if you capitalize the variables or functions, then the visibility is 
I mean, this, this function, this variable can be seen outside this package. So it's exported. And if you don't capitalize it, it will be not exported. Declarations are in a Pascal style, left to right. What does it mean? Basically, it means that it reads like type person is a struct which contains a name and a last name which is a string and an H which is an integer. For C or C++ formers, maybe it's a bit backwards, but hey, it's what it is. And variable P1, P2 point is a pointer to person, variable person is a slice of person, and so on. And if you don't like this bar keyword, you can also use the shortcut, which is only available inside functions. So you can say a semicolon equals zero, and that means that we declare a variable that is an integer because we can infer it from the right side, and it's initialized to zero. Functions can return multiple types, multiple values. So, for example, in this function, we have that it accepts a parameter, uh, s, which is a string, and two, it returns two values, a value which is an integer and error, which is an error. And note that we <coughs> do write this with just this. We, we do not have to put the names, but if we put the names, it will be declared for the function body. So it's nice if you, have, if you do that. And the parentheses are not mandatory if you only return one value. So if you just return an integer, that is just fine. Uh, also worth noting, functions are uh, first class citizens, also known as closures. So you can pass functions to as fun function parameters, or you can return functions, all that stuff. And I've written this monster thing, <laughs> which does the whole thing. Not very clever, but well, it's a function because I know how to name things and f which is a function that gets an x which is an integer that returns an integer and it returns a function that returns an integer and you can here write a return an anonymous function that does the job. What is the use case for that? Why would you want to This is just that? for the sake of the example this whole mess but uh, what do you mean the use case? Uh, like in the sense of why, why would you use this? Why do you want to pass uh, functions as parameters, for example? Why would you want to return a function that returns an integer? Like, what would it's like a uh, right? You you would see an example about that, but <laughs> but um, as a function, not really that much. No, maybe not that useful. But you can. Uh, write a generator of functions that follow some semantics of some sort, it's cool. It's just a first class of uh, Assignments, the increment and decrement, I think it's worth noting that they're not expressions, they are statements, so you cannot do that like in C that in A equals plus plus B. Uh, you can assign multiple values simultaneously, so you can do this nice trick of A, B equals B, A. You can Yes, and multiple values from a function that returns multiple values, or you can discard one of the values from the return. The switch is pretty similar to C, but it has two major differences, which is break is implicit. Oh, yeah. Um, can functions take variable number of arguments, and in addition, can they return variable number of yeah. parameters? Yeah. Okay. So there's a way of specifying that in the syntax. So break is implicit, so for example here, it won't fall through here, it, it's a break, it's implicit. If you want to fall through, you have to do it explicitly. You can have multiple values, like one, two, three here, or you can put Boolean expressions. Uh, the uh, the author's thought of looping in just one keyword for, you then have wilds, you can emulate them. But basically, the whole construct is like this, like C, and you initialize values here, condition, and then const loop. You can omit parts of it, so you can emulate a while, like in here. Or you can just use the, this handy thing that is for range, which basically is using a range, the range keyword uh, from a map or a slice uh, to assign to key value, or, or you can discard it since it's just an assignment. 
and then you can do something with P and pop it. Uh, zero sin, uh, you import packages. So if you import a package and then you don't use it, it's a compile error. It's not a warning, it's a compile error. Uh, it imports a relative to the go path source directory. So for example, you can import this that is from the standard library. And you can import um, remote uh, repositories, which are fetched through this command, go get and the URL, and this will get downloaded to the GoPath source directory, and then you can import it like in here. Uh, note that even though it can be tedious, that it's a build error, most editors like Vim, Sublime, and etc. Uh, already include a tool which is called Go Imports that uh, basically sort the imports and add Im imports that are missing or things like that, so it's not a pain to just all the time go checking if you have left an import or whatever. It's done on save, it works. So I cannot dive into the whole commands, but I can just give you what I think are the most handy. For example, go install will, be the, will do the right thing. It will build everything on the project, and it will install it in go path. You can use a go path, which is quite handy as well which will test the current package, or if you're looking for not just uh, testing the current package, but also the sub-packages, you can go to go test uh, the dot slash ellipsis, and you can do that with other commands like go get, like the previous go get, so you can get all the remote packages on your project, for example, and you can run a specific function from the test, so, so you don't have to uh, run all the tests. For example, test, test run index. Um, uh, if this is not the, the name of the function. It's just a is just a regular expression that matches the the name of the function. Uh, usually, fun, um, test functions have to start by, by test, so we would have to mean test index or whatever. And so the big elephant in the room here is concurrency. We've, we've, we've said many times that uh, Go is a uh, concurrent language and that's very important for the Go authors. And what does it mean is that first we have to start by wondering what is concurrency. Uh, there's this talk by Rob Pike, which is Concurrency is Naturalism, which sums up very well what I'm explaining at this slide. But basically it says that, well, concurrency is naturalism, obviously, and because concurrency is about how do you structure your code in a way that it's the composition, like I said here, the composition of independently executing quotations. I, I mean, it's how do you structure your code uh, to make it seem like it's independent executions. You can have concurrent uh, code without being parallel. You can run a concurrent code in a single processor, for example. You cannot run parallel code in just one processor to see. So parallelism is more simultaneous execution of different computations that might be related or might not. In concurrency, it's just how do you structure your code. And as I said, um, Rob Pike does a much better job at explaining this. So the concurrency model for Go is to think on guru teams, which I, I will explain later on. These go routines will share memory by communicating through channels and not communicating through sharing memory, so you avoid risk conditions, for example. And it offers a special syntax for all this, for synchronization, for sharing memory, memory, and so on. So first of all, what are go routines? You can think of go routines like threads, but you would have been likely mistaken. No, they are not really threads. Uh, they are multiplexed onto operating system threads as required. This means that the runtime will see all these Go routines and will manage it according to your resources. So if it makes sense to create a new thread, it will make it, not <coughs> The important thing here is whether they are mapped onto OS threads or not, they are independent from each other. Uh, so if one Go routine has been blocked, not all of them will be blocked. 
And basically, a go routine is calling a function call with the go keyword uh, that, uh, prefix to it. So if you have this function that you want to call it in a concrete way, you just say go banana and go banana. So it's useful to have multiple go routines, but they are not doing anything if they are not passing information between each other. And we do that in Go with channels. Channels are type values that are the way in which go routines pass information between each other. First of all, you create a channel with the make built in. So you, <coughs> for example, in here, we create a um, channel of integers called C. Then we have this special syntax for passing a value into a channel, which is the arrow. And we can get a value from a channel using similar syntax, which is arrow and the variable name. Note that if the uh, value is not already there for the channel, it will block. It will block. So here's a basic example. We uh, for this example, we start by creating a channel, a channel of integer, then we do stack with it in an independent go routine, and then we, we block here to get the, the result. And the go routine will just set C to 3, and when it's there, it and will be declared as an integer because it's inferred from the type, and it will get the 3, so printf should print. Three and three has printed. Yeah. What's the relationship between concurrency and threading? <coughs> you okay. Say concurrency is not parallelism, which I get, but yeah. it sounds a lot like threading. Is it the same thing? Uh, no. I, I mean, when you write concurrent code, it's, it can be parallelized easily. That's what threading more or less is. Threading is like uh, building uh, parallel jobs for the same application. Concurrent is structuring your code in a way that it does multiple things at once, even though it's not simultaneously, which is the point of parallelism. Mm -hmm. So parallel uh, programs will be concurrent, but it's not like concurrent. If your program is concurrent, it will be parallelizable, per se. I don't know if it makes any sense. <laughs> Intense, but I still don't get the relationship to threading because it's the same thing. Actually, it's not related. Concurrency is a concept from the scientists. Okay. You can do it without several codes, without threading, without anything. Just having uh, routines of code working, uh, collaborating, sending data to each one mm -hmm. to get the result. Let's talk about uh, core routines, I think in Python from my guy, David, I don't know the name now, but you can search for it, it's easy to, to find. And he explains a little bit where it's coming from. Okay. It yeah. looks like channels are tight. Is there a union like availability in the language to allow you to pass more than one type of thing between a channel? Is it really strongly tight? Um. Can you rephrase that? In, in, in C, there's a union type which yeah. allows to, um, it, your declaration showed as channels being declared as a particular type. Yeah. Um, so that at that point, the only thing that can be passed through that channel is, in this case, an integer, is that correct? Yeah. And there's, is there a union type in the language then which will allow me to sort of bypass that? Or are channels really strongly typed? I haven't really tried it. Uh, pass and an abstract uh, type that you can do by that by reflection, I guess. You can, whether or you can pass a channel uh, with the type of interface empty or things like that. I don't know if you have, you can surpass it. I I haven't tried that. The other question I have about channels is: Are they scoped to a package, the whole program? Well, yeah. Uh, as I said previously. Um, is it upper lowercase? Yeah. Okay. So it uses the same method. Yeah. So we that being said, we know it. Yeah, executed this. Um, I'm going to show you uh, just a couple of patterns around uh, around channels and routines and all that stuff, so it makes any more sense. 
but I'm gonna say at the end that more links are more appreciated. So basically, since tunnels are just first class citizens as well, you can return tunnels. And with this, I'm gonna show you a bit of a generic generator pattern. It basically is, I'm gonna look and I want to show you the 10 first Fibonacci numbers. And to do that, I'm gonna implement this function, fib, which basically returns a channel. And this range expression, what it's gonna do, is gonna say, give me more values channel. And to, when we get a value from it, we can print it, and it will show the Fibonacci numbers, okay? So how is this implemented? Fib is a function that accepts the n, which is how many Fibonacci numbers do you want to see, and it returns a channel of integers. So the common thing in this pattern is to, do, to just create the channel at, at the beginning, like this. So you create the c, which is a channel of integers, all that. And then you do something with it in a separate coroutine, and then you, re you return the channel. So what do we do in this coroutine? Basically, we do the Fibonacci thing. So we initialize A and B, which is 0 and 1, and we move from 0 to N, blah, blah, blah. And what we we'll get to the interesting thing is that we pass the value of the A, which is the Fibonacci number that we want to pass to the main thread. Uh, to C. And since C, the channel C is what this guy is expecting, it will get the value in, on each iteration. And when it's finished, we close the channel so the range expression say, okay, there, there are no more values, I can get out of the loop, and it will be done. So we'll get out of here and it has printed everything. So imagine that the previous function, for some reason, we cannot modify the code, but we want to filter the results being returned, so only even numbers are seen. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is to write a function, which is called filter, that accepts a tunnel of integers as the input, and it returns a tunnel of integers as well. So this is, a, this is pretty similar to the previous example. What we make here is to create a new channel of integers and return it at the end. And in the uh, go routine, what we do is to range over the input channel, which is a channel of integers. And for each value uh, from this channel, if it's an even number, we'll output to the, to the output channel, which is what the range uh, expression from the main function will see. So the main function now looks like this. So we arrange over the filter of fit n, and now we just see the even numbers of the Fibonacci number. Okay. So in the previous example, uh, I showed you about passing channels and returning channels. Now it's, it's more about we have multiple channels at our recurrent function, and we want to handle them in a concurrent way. We don't want to, for example, if you have channel 1, channel 2, to just wait for this one, but maybe values are getting lost from this one, and stuff like that. So for this reason, the Go authors implemented the select statement, which is built in in the language. And it's pretty similar to switch, if you think about it, but it works on channels. So it does select, and for each channel that you want to listen to, uh, you put it in the cost clauses, and you can put the value of the channel to, to a, a new variable and do something with it, or you just can ignore the value of the channel. And it works like this. So it will block. When we reach here, it will block. Unless if there is a default clause. You can write a default like in a switch statement. You can write a default clause and then it will be like if there is no value already, get out thing. 
I don't know if it's much useful to look at the full, but it is there. So um, to test this, what I'm going to do is to write the function that does a boring thing, <laughs> which is basically uh, to create a coroutine that will print something, which is basically the message that we passed, uh, and the iteration. And then we'll go to sleep for a random number of milliseconds. And I'm going to use this in this main function that basically what it does is to create a channel. So a speak return to channel, by the way. So create two channels, Bob and Alice, that speak together. And this is what is called the for select i, because what we do is to infinitely listen for these two channels through the select statement. Because if we remove the for, what it will do is to catch the first one and then get out. So if we put um, our for loop, it will run indefinitely listening to this value. Is, is, is there any guarantee that it won't always select the Bob channel? What? Is, it, can Alice get starved? Uh, no. So not starved, but I mean, it, it's conceivable that both channels always have something available. Yeah. Is there any guarantee that it will ever pick one, um, both, both channels? Or could it possibly, implementation-wise, always pick Bob, and, and nothing is ever used for Alice? If Alice is doing nothing, then yes. No, if, I mean, if Alice has something, if both Alice and Bob have something, yeah. is there any guarantee that it will round robin between them? I don't think so. Um, I think it won't get started if that's what uh, round tripping you can. Like, this channel depends on this one and you know, that lock way. You mean? Or well, if 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 the work that happens uh, after you select on um, thing is really expensive, the Alice and Bob channels ah, might okay. return, might always have something available when you get back to the select. So you mean in a situation where this thing is expensive? Is expensive. So okay. by the time you get back to select, Bob is ready again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it will. It will. So if we're doing something real expensive here and we receive a bottle for Alice, it will run the Alice thing. It will do the Alice yeah. next time. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because, well, if it's a single <laughs> CPU, for example, um, the run, go run thing will more or less schedule it so they don't start. And if we can run it in, in OS threads, they won't start because there are different threads and stuff like that. So, there's a way that they won't stop it, if that's what you mean. Well, it's not Alice and Bob starving, it's whether or not the this um, thread, well, not thread, <laughs> um, will ever actually look at both of them. And you seem to be saying it will. It will. They're, they're two different channels. So they will, they will respect the order of the code. It, the other thing is that is if they respect the order of the, uh, the variation, well, it's always going to get an Alice. No, no, no. They, it, it's not like they respect the order, but they respect the order in which they receive in which the they, So it keeps track of which one is the oldest yeah. and uses that one next. It, sort it, of. it keeps track in, into what, what's the next value to give and who to get it. Okay. So if we are in here in an expensive manner and then Alice gets something, it will go to Alice in. in Whenever this kettle fits, I think, I think it's near. What? No, no, it's like, it doesn't work. <laughs> so I think it'll be fine. So this will run indefinitely. I don't know. It is obviously not what we want to get something infinitely moving. So what one solution to this is to time it out. So the, the you can have the time package that implements this function called after that returns a channel and this channel will get a value after <coughs> a duration of time. So in this case after two seconds it will get a value of this time out. And when you put it into the previous example, 
is like Bob and Alice and they will stop you here, but in two seconds this will get executed. And timeout will just print timed out and exit. So Bob and Alice, blah blah blah. And timed out. So in what you were saying if Bob does something really expensive out of two seconds, okay. it's two seconds timeout, get out. What you said before was the, uh, if you have uh, both channels uh, receiving stuff, uh, they are going to get uh, processed in the order of arrival, taking into account both channels. Yeah. So if Bob gets the first thing, then Alice gets two things, and then Bob gets another thing, those, uh, those uh, uh, elements are going to be processed in that order. First Bob, then two for Alice, yeah. then one for Bob. Yeah, so, so the thing here is that it runs concurrently, so it's like, imagine that Bob receives something and Bob is, is spends like three seconds doing this, this talk and Alice receives two things and well, after two seconds this guy will get the value, so it will execute it as well and this does exit. So it's not like I'm waiting you to process your thing, but here's your data do your stop, here's your data, do your stop, and the same for this guy. Do you, do you already need to, um, to consume the, the channel to be able to see if you're shopping thing? Uh, go again. Do you, do you need to consume what is in the channel to be able to, uh, I mean, let's say that you want to implement some logic. When you do just read it, you are consuming, if that makes any sense. So, when, by consuming, you mean, you get the value and and Go says that you don't have any more of it. Let's say, no? Do you have a has next? Ah, a has then, next. Yeah. No. You just go on and on and... <laughs> mm -hmm. I, have, I have one question about channels. Uh, uh, is there a possibility to have more than one client for a channel or, or is it just one? In each level, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for the same example as before, um, as you see, Bob and Alice basically do the same stuff. They just print themselves. So in some bands, it's useful to create a function that gets multiple channels and then outputs uh, a single channel. So this output channel is the result of these two guys. And the funny function, what it does is something exactly uh, pretty similar to what we've seen so far. It creates the channel, does something with the routine, return the channel, which is the result one. And then in here we have this for select, and when we get a value from either first or second, we pass the value given to the final output channel. So the previous main function looks like this now. We created this C channel from Bob and Alice, and Independently, if the value gets to Bob or Alice, it will just do the same because now we're listening to C here. And it should run in the same way as before. And, well, these are the three times that I think that um, might get you more far than you <laughs> in regards to concurrency and parallelism you can go. So there's this talk from drop five concurrency is not parallelism that will get you more far in regards to what is concurrency, what is parallelism, the difference between them. Uh, then there's the go concurrency pattern which shows you more patterns in regards to go. And finally, this is a great talk in regards to concurrency patterns, which is advanced go concurrency patterns. Um, if you want the slides, I, I can give you them after the talk. You can put them in the middle of it. Yeah, yeah, okay. You can do that. And finally, which is more controversial, I guess, <laughs> which is to say that go is object oriented. Some might disagree, some might agree. <laughs> I don't know. Um, is it really object-oriented? 
Some say no, yeah, but in the, not in the usual way. I, I would say that. It's not object oriented in the way that it has classes and subclasses and inheritance and all that, but we will see how does the object orientation, and the spoiler alert is based on composition. So you don't have classes, you have types. And in this case, for example, type user, which is a struct, name plus name, age, and as you can see, apart from the type, you can also pass a tag. This tag is just metadata that goes stored into the, in this case, the H, H field. And basically, if you use reflection, you can get the metadata from here. This example shows the uh, JSON that the type contains JSON and, and a dash, which means that for the JSON uh, package, when we want to, if you would want it to marshal this struct into into JSON data, uh, this this field here will get important. You can read more in the JSON package, but you can also aliens by just saying that type my own string is a string, and so you can use my own string as an string. And actually, it can be useful, but because then in your pack, in your packets, you can add functions to this new my own string, which is basically a string. This might make sense because, <coughs> as as you can see, you can add functions uh, into a type. This thing here is called the receiver of the function of the function, and we can only add uh, functions to a type which is containing the same package. So if we want to extend a type from another package, it maybe makes sense to do it like that. <coughs> so when you come from a language like C++ or Java or Ruby, uh, you will see that, yeah, you told me that it has object orientation, but it doesn't do inheritance, it doesn't do a subclass polymorphism, it doesn't do generics, which is not really typing at all. Object orientation, but anyways. Um, instead, it emphasizes this thing called interfaces. So, what is an interface? Uh, basically, an interface is, it defines a set of methods. It doesn't a back of methods. So, for example, here we have the interface stringer, which is from the um, uh, library, the built in library, and it defines just the string method. Uh, why do we do this? So, a type can implement an interface by just implementing the function string, which returns a string. And interfaces are implemented implicitly. You don't have to say that my type implements this interface and this interface. It's kind of like that typing. Like, it's not about what type are you, just which methods do you know how to call. And all these if the requirement of that you implement these interfaces is checked at compile time. <coughs> so for any given type that in this example defines a string function and that returns a string function is set that it implements a stringer and all types implement the empty interface because empty interface means that you implement no method and by default uh, types define no method. So it makes sense. And here's a basic example, which is from a web application I did. And, and this you can, you can see that I have this type, which is a res called response, which has this field called message and error. And you, as, I, as I told you, you can put tags into it. So in this case, for example, I say that for the JSON package that uh, the message has to be translated into the key msg and you have to emit it if it's empty and for the same with error. And basically here I'm implementing this stringer interface by attaching the string method that returns the string to the to my response type. And what I'm doing here is that if you want to put my type there to a string what I'm going to do is to marshal it into JSON, and then I'm going to return this marshaled uh, JSON. 
So in uh, this example, uh, I have this main function that defines uh, declares and it initializes a response which does a message hello and then we print and then we print the this response and how does printf knows how how to how to print the response basically because printf just wants stringers that types that know how to put themselves into a string and since we've done it in response it works and in this example we said message hello which is what we've done here but now we're shutting the reason But that was a uh, pretty humble example. The more complex, complete example is the IO reader interface. Uh, the IO reader basically says that uh, you only have to implement the read, uh, the read function, which returns an end, which is an integer, an error, and an error, to read stuff. And basically, the package is about read, uh, bytes. In, and it implements the reader interface, it will read bytes, if it's a string, it will read uh, strings, if it's, um, I don't know, listening to a TCP uh, socket and reading into it, then if you, it implements this type, implement the read method, then you will do that in a transparent way. So interfaces separate the data from the paper. That's the, that's the intelligent way to say it. <clears throat> and since typically interfaces are small, they just implement one or three methods or require one or three methods to be implemented. You can often see in the, uh, that you can chain uh, interfaces. So for example, the IO package declares this function, which is called copy, which accepts a writer that is an interface and reader that is an interface. So with copy, you can read from anywhere and to copy it to anywhere if you know how to read and how to write. It's independent to how to do you read or where do you read, and the same for how do you write, what, and all this stuff. So my thoughts on interfaces, I was pretty skeptic, skeptical about interfaces when I first uh, saw it, but as I've written Go code, I saw that composition is key. You don't have to think about your programming, your program, how do you start your program as classes and how they interact together, rather like how they compose together, how they interact together, and you can do that through interfaces. And so in Go, you don't have explicit hierarchy because we do everything in interfaces, so we don't need subclassing or overloading or anything like that. And basically interfaces are incredibly simple and easy to use. You just have to implement this string function and, and magically you can print yourself, your thumb. And it's the way that Go implements object orientation without having to specify how do you subclass or how do you uh, write them overloaded functions or anything like that. Uh, I have just one question. Yeah. How do you share the implementation of uh, an interface, for example, uh, in other languages you have huge hierarchies of uh, enumerable array stuff, and, and mm -hmm. you have not only an interface per se, but implementation <laughs> that is shared. How do you uh, so I think that what you're saying is how to share Im implementation of different uh, yeah. interfaces, like so, uh, with like subclasses. Like also, you can do it some others. Yes, I understand that. Um, you, you don't do that. <laughs> uh, no, uh, it's not about. It's not about. That's it's all through subclassing. I, I guess what you're saying. So you call the super um, function and all, and all that, and you don't do that. You compose types. So you don't say that I have my string, which is a subclass of the regular string, and I can reuse this. this so for example, if I want a, a, a list, I, I want to have a list of uh, uh, a, a, a 
most of these that's implemented in a, in a particular way. <coughs> uh, what I want to uh, uh, take, uh, I want to use the implementations of the uh, sorting algorithms that are hmm. implemented for other lists. Hmm. Uh, the, algori the algorithms are complex. Yeah. It's the same interface. I want to use those. Okay. Yes, you, you cannot do that. You, you cannot uh, reuse implementation. You just you just can say how it's going to the interface how interface how it's going to look like, but you cannot share the implementation of this particular type that implements this interface with other lists. So yeah, you can you have to repeat yourself here. Okay. And well, I can go talk and talk, but I guess it, that this means you can do much more by clicking this link, which is the page of the language. You can do a go tour and do a tour on the language on the web browser itself. You don't have to download go to try it out. You can see the documentation of the, the package, the package, the built-in packages, which are really nice and. There's long documentation about it. Um, thank you. Yeah. And then, what, what's the runtime? What does it compile then? then to? Oh, so how does it point down in the executable? Okay. So uh, it's statically uh, linked. Everything. So you have in a single executable file you have your program, the, your libraries, and the runtime. The runtime is responsible for scheduling the go routes <coughs> and for the garbage collector and all that. Mm. So you have everything into the executable file. That makes sense. You can ask more questions uh, drinking beer. <laughs> <laughs> so we can finish this and we can start with the working.